In 1989, Ken Sarawaiwa, a Nigerian writer and political activist, published his short story titled Africa Kills Her Son, which tragically foreshadowed his own fate six years later. Sarawaiwa was imprisoned and eventually executed by Nigeria's military regime for his advocacy on behalf of the Agoni people. The story takes the form of a letter written by the protagonist and narrator, Bana, to his former girlfriend on the eve of his execution. Through this poignant piece, Sarawaiwa presents a dark satire that exposes the rampant corruption, moral decay, and lawlessness permeating Nigerian society. In Africa Kills Her Son, Sarawaiwa attributes the challenges faced by African people in their pursuit of a fulfilling life to these corrosive societal traits. While the story is a work of fiction, it draws upon real-life instances of corruption, brutality, and abuses of power, citing notorious leaders like Idi Amin of Uganda and Jean Bidel Bokassa of the Central African Republic, who was accused of heinous crimes such as cannibalism. The narrative unfolds within an unnamed Nigerian prison during the 1990s, with Bana composing his letter from this confined space. Addressed to Zol, his long-lost love, Bana reminisces about their pure and unfulfilled romance as a source of solace amidst the pain he endures. In his final moments, he seeks a small favor from Zol, confident that the letter will reach her due to the prison guard's susceptibility to bribery. Bana acknowledges that the guard, who is easily corrupted, will never face consequences for his actions, even though he deserves to share Bana's fate at the firing squad. Alongside Bana, two other men, Sazen and Jimba, also facing imminent death, choose to celebrate their last night on earth rather than dwell on their impending doom. In a remarkable twist, Bana and his two companions have played a memorable game on the other thief, the high court judge who presided over their trial. Surprisingly, they admitted their guilt and insisted on receiving the harshest punishment possible, leaving the judge dumbfounded. This deliberate act was designed to avoid the spectacle of deceitful lawyers and biased courts. By confessing to being armed robbers, they believed they were staying true to themselves, their calling, their country, and humanity itself. Their aim was to deny the judge the power to pass judgment and instead make him a captive of their words. Bana proceeds to recount the events that led him to become a bandit. After encountering a prostitute who candidly shared her reasons for choosing her profession, Bana was struck by her unapologetic honesty. Inspired by her words, he decided to leave his job in the Merchant Navy and accept a position at the Ministry of Defense. There, he witnessed firsthand the blatant plundering of the National Treasury. When he attempted to expose this corruption, he was promptly dismissed. Rather than re-entering a society that covertly robbed its own people, Bana chose to live openly as a thief and bandit, rejecting the deceptive practices of those around him. As Bana contemplates Sazen and Jimba sleeping beside him on the floor, he recognizes their qualities that would make them exceptional second-in-command to the warlords currently ravaging African nations. Sazen, a former sergeant in the army, and Jimba, a police corporal, embody bravery and heroism, exemplified by their peaceful slumber, despite their impending execution. Sadly, their courage is not celebrated in their country, instead, it is suppressed. Nevertheless, the truth remains that the three men are innocent of the crime for which they are being executed. Their criminal activities revolved around robbery, but they never resorted to taking lives. However, an unfortunate turn of events occurred during one of their heists, when a police officer lost his life. Rather than allowing their lower-ranking gang members to shoulder the blame, Bana, Sazen, and Jimba stepped forward to accept responsibility. In Bana's perspective, there was little distinction between their actions and the pervasive thievery that permeates society. Regardless of one's profession, theft seemed to be the prevailing occupation across the land. Although the prison they inhabit is easily escapable, the trio has no desire to flee. Instead, they believe that death will grant them true freedom, while the living remain trapped in their self-constructed prisons. Bana delves into contemplation about their impending execution. Will their bodies be discarded in the ocean to serve as sustenance for fish, thus becoming part of the food chain and eventually nourishing other human beings? No, their fate will be to become a spectacle in the stadium. A hypocritical priest will attempt to offer them solace, only to be rebuffed. The audience in the stands will respond to the gruesome display with the same base excitement as they would to a soccer game. Subsequently, individuals burdened with the task of disposing of their lifeless bodies will deposit them in an unmarked mass grave. 
newspapers will document the events that unfolded. Now, Bonna reveals a small request for Zol. He asks her to find a newspaper photograph of him after the execution and present it to a sculptor. The sculptor's task would be to create a stone sculpture of Bonna that faithfully captures his likeness from the photograph. Sazen and Jimbo waken, suspicious that Bonna has been engrossed in composing a love letter to a mysterious girlfriend throughout the night. However, upon understanding the significance of how he chose to spend his final hours, Sazen decides to also document his thoughts. Unfortunately, it is now too late, and they find themselves lacking sufficient paper for writing. Bonna revisits the topic of his desired statue, which he believes should serve as his grave marker. As for an epitaph, he desires something truly enigmatic. Drawing inspiration from a newspaper article about an African leader grieving for a beloved lieutenant, who stated, Africa kills her sons, Bonna decides that his own tombstone should bear the perplexing inscription, Africa kills her Sunday. In a final bittersweet jest before bidding farewell, Bonna quips, a fitting epitaph, don't you think? Cryptic. Definitive. A stroke of brilliance, I must say. I'm certain you'll concur. Africa kills her son. Is that why the continent has been referred to as the Dark Continent? Yes. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe thank you.